Hello, I'm Father James Kabicki, the National Director of the Apostleship of Prayer, and this is the fourth presentation of five on my book, A Heart on Fire, Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And today we'll be looking at chapters seven and eight. <clears throat> In our previous chapters, we looked at the Sacred Heart devotion from the perspective of the Eucharist, and we said that deep down, Eucharistic devotion and Sacred Heart devotion go together. And that the more devoted we are to the heart of Jesus, the more devoted we are to his body and blood present in the Eucharist. And the more devoted we are to the Eucharist, the more we draw close to his heart because it is in the Eucharist that we meet Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity, including his Sacred Heart. And in fact, when Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary and any number of other mystics and saints, it was usually in the context of their adoring him in the Blessed Sacrament. And it was at that moment that Jesus appeared to them and revealed his heart all on fire and invited them to an exchange of hearts where he would give them his heart and he would take from them their hearts and place their hearts within his heart. And in that way, the two hearts would be one. Ultimately, that's what we're made for, union with God. And it begins right here on earth in the blessed Eucharist, in the Holy Eucharist, where we receive the body and blood of Jesus and he unites himself to us and the two become one. Pope St. John Paul II liked to say very often that we're made for a spousal relationship with God. We're made to be one with God forever. And that spousal relationship means the two become one, one flesh, just as we think of marriage, where it says, a uh, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. St. Paul talking about this in Ephesians chapter five, says this is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. Jesus is the bridegroom of the church, the bridegroom of each individual soul. And so Eucharistic devotion, Sacred Heart devotion, the two go together. And last time we talked about how united with Jesus, we share in his work, his work of reconciling the world to the Father and people to one another, the work of reconciliation, the work of reparation, where we repair the damage that sin has caused in our world. And we make up for the wrong in our world with good, with great good. And so ultimately, this devotion that we have leads us to share in Jesus' work. It's not simply that we're going to have this one-on-one -on -one relationship, which we do have, but it's not just a Jesus and me relationship that excludes other people. Uh, the more deeply we enter into the heart of Jesus, the more we share the concerns of his heart, the concerns for this wounded world in which sin has terrible effects in the lives of people. It's the ruins of a world that is given to war and conflict. And God wants so much more for us. And so he sent his son to save us from that sin and we now, as members of the body of Christ, continue his work in the world. We do what Jesus did, offering ourselves for the salvation of souls, for the reparation of sin, for the building up of the civilization of love, the coming of the kingdom of God. In 2005, Pope John Paul had called for a year of the Eucharist. It began in October 2004, ended in October 2005. And his desire in calling for this year of the Eucharist was that we might renew our Eucharistic amazement, that we would reflect upon the great gift that God has given us in the Eucharist, and that this would fill us with such wonder and awe that the only way we could describe it is we would be amazed and we would experience amazement every time we celebrated the Eucharist. The Synod of Bishops of 2005 brought that year of the Eucharist to a conclusion. Pope 
John Paul had died in the previous April. Pope Benedict continued the work of the year of the Eucharist and the Synod of Bishops in 2005. And afterwards, he pulled together the discussions of the bishops about the Eucharist. He wrote a document called Sacramentum Caritatis, the Sacrament of Charity, Sacrament of Love. And in there, he said that the Eucharist is three mysteries. A mystery to be believed, a mystery to be celebrated, and a mystery to be lived. I think for the most part, we can say we understand what it means to believe in the Eucharist, and we celebrate the Eucharist on Sundays and other days, so we know what that means. But even there, I think we can go deeper. What do we believe about the Eucharist? We believe, as the Second Vatican Council taught, that Jesus is present in four ways. First, he's present in the congregation. Jesus said, wherever two or three gather in my name, there am I. Secondly, he's present in the presider, the priest who is leading the worship. He acts in persona Christi. And so when he says the words of consecration, this is my body, this is my blood, he's not acting on his own. He's not talking about himself and his body and blood, but he's acting in the person of Christ. That's the second way Jesus is present. Thirdly, and we've talked about this, Jesus is present in the word, proclaiming the word. And fourthly, and especially, he is present in the elements. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. But we could also say what we believe about the Eucharist is that Jesus makes present in every celebration of the Eucharist his life-giving death and resurrection. He makes that present to us. Pope John Paul, in calling for the year of the Eucharist, talked about this. And he said that while our first impression of the Eucharist is that it is a memorial meal, it's the commemoration of the Last Supper, he said, but it is also first and foremost, profoundly and primarily, a sacrifice in which Jesus makes present his life-giving death and resurrection. And so every time we celebrate Mass, we're present for that. And we experience that love that he showed on the cross and in his resurrection from the tomb. That love is designed to change us. And if we really believe what the church teaches about the Eucharist, that Christ makes present his life-giving death and resurrection, and that this making present of the Paschal mystery is the power that transforms the bread and wine into his body and blood. If we really believe that, on that deep level of amazement, then we would be so filled with his love that we would live the Eucharist in our daily lives. We would live that love in our daily lives. Pope Francis, uh, you know, every day he celebrates Mass and gives a little homily. And back in 2014, in February, he gave a little homily. It has a very interesting title. It's called, At Mass Without a Watch. And in his little homily, he talks about how the Mass is different from any other kind of prayer. Beautiful prayer when we gather in church, pray the rosary, make the stations of the cross, pray in our homes, all beautiful prayers. But the Mass is so much more. And he called it a theophany. A theophany is where God makes himself present to people. And that's what Jesus does in every celebration of the Mass. He makes his life-giving death and resurrection present, and he makes himself present to us. And he gives himself to us then in a holy communion. And Pope Francis said, we don't go to Mass just to be passive observers. We don't listen to Mass being celebrated but we're called to participate in Mass. And that means more than standing and sitting and kneeling and responding. It means that our hearts are engaged in the celebration of the Mass. Pope Benedict talked about this in a video message that he sent to the Eucharistic Congress in Dublin, Ireland, in the year 2012. And in his message to them, he said, active participation is more than our physical presence or participation, but it involves our minds and our hearts. And this is where I think Sacred Heart Devotion can help us celebrate Mass in a 
deeper and more profound way where we open ourselves up to the grace that is given to us in every celebration of the Mass. But then we have to go out and live the Mass in our daily lives. So we don't just end our celebration, but the celebration continues as we live the Eucharist and the transformation that occurs, where we live our union with God that has occurred in every Holy Communion, every celebration of the Mass. In the document Sacramentum Caritatis, Pope Benedict talked about this living the Eucharist, this mystery of living the Eucharist. And here's how he put it. Worship, pleasing to God, becomes a new way of living our whole life, each particular moment of which is lifted up since it is lived as part of a relationship with Christ and as an offering to God. And then he says, the worship of God tends by its very nature to permeate every aspect of our existence. He goes on to say, and this is quoting the um, bishops who had a working document, and he's quoting right from that working document. He says, the Christian faithful need a fuller understanding of the relationship between the Eucharist and their daily lives. Eucharistic spirituality is not just participation in Mass and devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. It embraces the whole of life. It embraces the whole of life. In other words, after we celebrate the Eucharist, we go out and live it. And we don't just live it with a few prayers that we say during the day, but with our whole life. And this is what the morning offering is designed to do. It's a way that we begin the day receiving each day as a gift from God and then making an offering of that whole day, however we put it, with every beat of our heart, every breath of our lungs, every thought, every word, every deed, or as the traditional formula of the morning offering goes, every prayer, work, joy, and suffering. Every moment of the day is offered to God as a sacrifice of love. Jesus offered himself completely to humanity. He did that on the cross, and as he rose from the dead, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and humanity, as it were, goes with him. Now we, as members of his body, are called to join in that total offering of ourselves. We're called to make that offering of ourselves one day at a time, each moment at a time. This is where Father Chris Collins' book comes into play. He wrote this wonderful book called Three Moments of the Day. And it's actually more than moments, it's the whole day. But the three moments that he refers to are, first of all, the morning offering, where we begin the day. And if, if you're like me, it's best to begin it even before you get out of bed. So as soon as you wake up, pray an offering prayer in your own words, or in one of the traditional formula. And offer your day to God from the very beginning. Then, at the end of the day, it's good to review the day that we offered to God, to ask ourselves, what was in this day that I offered God? What was God pleased with? What was God smiling at? Or as we look at the day, we may see that there was something in the day that really was not worthy of God, and we're sorry that that was part of the day that we offered to God. We didn't intend it when we began the day, but there we slipped into something, a sin, a weakness that was not worthy of God. And so we end the day sorry for the things that we offered in the day that were not worthy of God, but happy that we were able to offer God things in our day that made God smile. And if we do this, we have these bookends to the day, the morning offering, the evening review. If we do that, it will make us more conscious during the day of all the opportunities we have to ask for God's help at any given moment, to make a special offering of something that we're looking forward to. And so we're filled with gratitude and thanksgiving for what we are offering because it fills us and God with joy. Or we may anticipate something that is going to be difficult 
and we ask for God's help and we offer that difficulty, that hardship, that pain as a cross, our own cross that we carry and which we unite to Jesus' cross. And in that way, our offering joined to his has eternal significance and plays a role in the ongoing work of salvation. So morning offering, evening review helps us throughout the day to live that, let's say, second moment, which is all the moments of our day lived as an offering to God. And this comes from the uh, letter of St. Paul, Romans chapter 12, where St. Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. As we've said uh, before, uh, Jesus made the perfect offering of himself, and that replaced all the Old Testament offerings of animals and cereal and grain. Now we, as members of his body, join in offering ourselves to the Lord, to God the Father, with Jesus. And every moment of our lives then becomes significant. It can play a part in the ongoing work of reparation, the ongoing work of salvation. That's what it means to live the Eucharist in our daily lives. St. John Paul, in the letter announcing the year of the Eucharist, offered at the conclusion of his apostolic letter announcing that year, offered a suggestion. He said, could not the year of the Eucharist be lived in such a way that we reach out and respond to one of the many forms of poverty in our world. And then he mentioned the millions of people suffering from hunger or from disease. He mentioned the loneliness of older people who are in many cases abandoned and tossed aside by society and that hunger they have for love. He mentioned immigrants and the unemployed. And then he said, by our mutual love for one another, we will be known as followers of Jesus. This will be the criterion by which we judge the authenticity of our celebration. In other words, our celebration of the liturgy of the Eucharist is not just a matter of nice music, good preaching, a good feeling in the community, but the real criterion to judge our celebration is the effect it has in our daily lives, whether or not we live that Eucharistic offering in our daily lives. Pope Benedict had a very similar thing to say, and this was in a conference in Rome, a diocesan conference, back in the year 2010. He said this, the Eucharist celebrated obliges us and at the same time enables us, or I would say empowers us in our turn to become bread broken for our brothers and sisters, meeting their needs and giving ourselves. For this reason, he says, and these are very strong words, a Eucharistic celebration that does not lead to meeting people where they live, work, and suffer in order to bring them God's love does not express the truth it contains. Did you see what he said? If our celebration does not lead us to live lives of service and love for others, then it has not expressed the truth it contains. It's been a lie. It's been a false celebration. So living the Eucharist is essential to being Christians. Now, again, one practical way that we do this is the morning offering, prayed and lived. And in fact, that's what the bishops in their working document prior to the Synod of Bishops 2005 suggested. This is proposition number 43. They said, the daily offering taught, for example, in the apostleship of prayer, practiced by millions of Catholics worldwide, can help each one to become a Eucharistic figure. And this expression, Eucharistic figure, is in quotation marks. Who is the great Eucharistic figure besides our Lord who offered himself on the cross? The Synod of Bishops said, following the example of Mary. 
uniting one's own life to that of Christ who offers himself for humanity. So practically speaking, praying the morning offering, reviewing the day that we offered, living that offering, all of this helps us to be like Mary, to say yes to God at each moment of our lives as she said yes to God's will for her and Jesus then took flesh. And as we say yes, then we live our oneness with Jesus, the one flesh body of Christ. We truly give flesh to the Lord when we say yes to him and live that Eucharist in our daily lives. And Mary is also a Eucharistic figure because at the end of Jesus' earthly life, as he was dying on the cross, Mary stood under the cross and offered her sufferings, the sufferings that only a mother could know watching her flesh and blood suffer in that way. She offered them with Jesus who took her sufferings, united them to his own, and in that way, the two as one heart played a role in the work of salvation. Jesus now invites us to do the same in our lives. So this is what it means to live the Eucharistic life. This is why Sacred Heart Devotion, our response to the great love of God revealed in the heart of Jesus, revealed in the Eucharistic heart of Jesus, why our whole life is meant to be a response and offering as well. Which brings me to chapter 8 of our book, A Heart on Fire, Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In chapter 8, I talk about various devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, things that have become traditionally part of our living out our deep love for Jesus. And remember, from the beginning, we've said that Sacred Heart devotion is the devotion of all devotions. One, because it's Eucharistic and it focuses on Jesus Christ and his love. And all other devotion is meant to, as it were, feed this love for Jesus and knowledge of his love for us. And so practicing Sacred Heart devotion is not so much a matter of praying certain prayers or engaging in different devotions. That's part of it, but it shouldn't end there. Our growth in devotion, in love, should lead us to this offering of ourselves. So in other words, all these different devotions we're going to be talking about now in a moment should feed our devotional life, should help us so that when we go to celebrate Mass, we're celebrating not in a disinterested, distracted way, but with our hearts truly engaged, our hearts set on fire by the liturgy of the Word, by our practice of the litany of the Sacred Heart, our consecration, all the different ways that we can live a good, strong prayer life, a devotional life, that should feed our celebration of the Eucharist and help us draw more from it to help us then go out and live it. So ultimately, as we've said, Sacred Heart devotion is not our devotions or our devotion, but God's devotion to us. And these various devotions are designed to open our hearts up to know that love that he has for us in a deeper way. In my book then, I list various devotions that have become part of what has been known as Sacred Heart Devotion, and I talk about personal consecration. Um, there are different prayers that one can use, uh, and again, the words of the prayers should express what's in our heart. So we don't just read the prayer with our minds distracted, but we try to read the prayer, pray the prayer in a way that the words say what is truly in our heart. And the whole idea of consecration is to renew the covenant that we have with the Lord. In other words, at baptism, we were all consecrated to the Lord. At baptism, we received the sacred chrism. This is the chrism that's used to consecrate new churches. The walls of the, of the chapel are painted with this sacred chrism to set aside that place as a sacred space, consecrating it for worship. And the altar receives the sacred chrism, anointing it, consecrating it to sacred worship. 
In the same way, my hands, the hands of every priest, are consecrated with sacred chrism, he basically setting them aside for the sacred purpose of offering worship. But each of us at baptism and confirmation received that same sacred chrism on our heads, setting each one of us aside, consecrating us for a sacred purpose. Why then would we do another consecration? Why would we say a prayer of personal consecration? The reason being is it's a way for us to renew our covenant with the Lord. Just as every Easter we renew our baptismal promises, so this is a way of, again, perhaps going a little deeper in our relationship with the Lord. A way of saying, I am yours and I want to be only yours. I consecrate myself to you for your purpose. That's personal consecration. Then we also have communal consecration, where parishes, cities, dioceses, nations, and in fact the world, consecrate themselves to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we see this becoming very popular in the 1800s, culminating in many ways in 1899, when Pope Leo XIII consecrated the world to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, consecrated the human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He was encouraged to do this by a religious woman, a contemplative of the Good Shepherd, who received uh, a vision from our Lord, an apparition in which he called for this consecration. Um, she was given the task of telling Pope Leo XIII to do this. He wondered whether or not he had the authority to consecrate the entire world to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And in the theological reflection that was done by different theologians, professors, um, what they concluded was this. Jesus died on the cross, not for just some people, but for everyone. He shed his precious blood for everyone. In that way, everyone has been, as it were, consecrated by Jesus. He died to save them. Now, we have to accept what Jesus did. We have to accept that precious blood and his salvation that he won for us, his mercy, and we have to live that. But we can consecrate the whole world, offer the whole world to the Lord as an offering, reminding ourselves that he died to save every one of us. Another particular form of communal consecration that is very popular and became more popular in the early 1900s through the 20th century uh, because of a priest of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, Father Matteo Crowley Bove. He was called in a very special way to promote family consecration or what's also known as enthronement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in homes and in families. This comes out of some of the letters of St. Margaret Mary, which talk about having an image of the Sacred Heart in a home and families dedicating themselves to uh, living out a particular consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Father Matteo Crowley Bove spread this throughout the world, became very popular. Here in the U.S., there's a group in Syracuse, New York, uh, called the Sacred Heart Apostolate that has been promoting this throughout the country. And in the Apostleship of Prayer, we have a particular leaflet that is designed to help people pray as a family and consecrate themselves. Uh, the idea is this, that you find an image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus that you enthrone or place in a very prominent place in your, your home. And in this way, you declare Jesus to be the king and center of your home, of your family. Now, I always tell people, it's not enough just to consecrate your family or to enthrone an image. Similar to a, a marriage. The marriage is more than the ceremony, more than the wedding. The marriage has to be lived in daily life. And so too with family consecration. We don't just have a nice ceremony enthroning an image 
and uh, praying as a family, and then we go about our lives. But we have to live that consecration as a family. In that way, when families gather to discuss things like, what are we going to do for a vacation? Or what kind of entertainment will we have in the home? The question should be, Jesus is the king and center and the head of this family. What will we do as a family to honor him? Does this entertainment that we're bringing into our home give him honor? Would we be embarrassed if Jesus were to come visit today and see how we as a family are living our family life? Also, when conflicts arise in the family, it's a good idea for those who are in conflict, whether it's the couple, the spouses, or the children with the parents, to go before that image of Jesus and to pray first. When you realize things are getting out of control here, go before the image and pray. Renew your consecration. Say, we have made Jesus the head and center of this family, the heart of our family. Jesus, help us to resolve this conflict. Help us to be a family after your own heart. So this is family consecration. We also have many, many different images of Jesus that we can put in our homes, but a particular practice of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus involves the badge. Now, this goes back to St. Margaret Mary. Jesus told her to pen with ink and, and pen and paper an image of himself and to pin that image close to her heart. And out of this, then, we have the tradition of Sacred Heart badges. These became very popular in France in the 1700s, where there was a plague in Marseille, and people consecrated the city to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The plague stopped immediately. And many people, in gratitude for this, began wearing these images. They also became a sign of those who uh, were standing against the forces of secularization and revolution during the French Revolution. And so many of the martyrs of the French Revolution went to their death because they were carrying or wearing these images of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, we have many different kinds of these. One of my favorite is the kind that has a uh, kind of embroidery around it. And you can wear these in a pocket, carry them in your wallet. These are ways of declaring, Jesus, I want you to be the king of my life. So those are Sacred Heart badges. More recently, we came up with the idea in the Apostleship of Prayer to take that original pen and ink drawing that St. Margaret Mary drew of the heart of Jesus and to put it on a card, uh, like a credit card, and uh, to allow people then to carry this in their pocket or again in their wallets, thinking this may be a more contemporary way of uh, expressing this dedication to Jesus, this consecration. And so on the back we have a, a beautiful little prayer. It goes, Jesus, from my heart I give you all my love, for you first loved me. Let me love others with love like yours. Heart of Christ, be mine. Amen. And then you can carry that in your pocket or on your person. Those are uh, images of the Sacred Heart badges. And then we have the promises of the Sacred Heart. Um, in the letters of St. Margaret Mary, you'll find Jesus speaking to her and offering several promises. In the 1800s, these were gathered together in France and became what is known as the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. A Dayton, Ohio printer took these 12 promises, printed them on a card, and started distributing them. His business went out of control. He, he, there was such a demand for these that they were translated into over 250 different languages and spread throughout the world. And these are what is known as the 12 promises. We don't find them given in that form of 12 promises. They appear throughout St. Margaret Mary's letters, but they've been pulled together into these 12 promises. And they're beautiful promises about 
devotion to the heart of Jesus. And if we are devoted, our families will experience peace. If we have an image in our homes, we will be blessed. If priests are devoted to his heart, they will have a particular knack for touching the most refractory, cold souls. Um, and then there's the famous promise, the 12th promise, that has to do with going to confession, Holy Communion, and um, offering oneself on the nine first Fridays of a month. The idea being that this will lead then to uh, the Lord's special favor and that at the end of one's life, one will not come to the end of one's life without the necessary graces needed for uh, passing from this life to the next and to the Lord. It's, it's not, uh, as some people think of it, an automatic ticket for heaven and you do these nine First Fridays and then you go out and do whatever you want and live your life as you wish, uh, that's not uh, practicing this devotion in good faith. But the hope is that by making these nine First Fridays, it will lead one to want to continue the practice and to honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the first Friday of each month throughout one's life. Then we have Divine Mercy which some people think of as uh, perhaps a substitute or replacement for Sacred Heart devotion. But if you read the diary of St. Faustina, you'll see that throughout in her speaking with Jesus and his appearance to her, it's all in the context of the Eucharist and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And many of the things she writes sound very much like what Jesus said to St. Margaret Mary how Jesus was concerned and sad that so few people responded to his mercy and to his love, that their hearts were cold. And so he called for reparation, and he called for the beautiful feast of divine mercy, which is a very Eucharistic feast. When we pray the chaplet of divine mercy, we offer, as we say, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. That's the Eucharist. And as we pray that chaplet, we can renew our own daily offering and our offering of ourselves. Dr. Robert Stackpole, who was the director of the St. John Paul II Inst uh, Institute of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, said, Jesus has only one heart. It's a sacred heart that is a merciful heart. And in the image of Divine Mercy, you see coming from his interior, his heart, the white and the red ray representing the blood and the water that came from his pierced heart on the cross. So divine mercy, devotion, sacred heart of Jesus devotion, they're not in competition, but they really go together very wonderfully. And lastly, I want to say something about devotion to the immaculate heart of Mary. Pope Benedict said, that the heart that is most like the heart of Jesus is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so, if we want to be devoted to His heart, it leads us to also want to be devoted to her heart. To honor the mother is pleasing to the son. Jesus is pleased when we honor His mother. And when we try to have a heart like hers, a heart that was totally open to God's will. And that's why in the traditional form of the morning offering, we pray, O Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As Jesus came to us through Mary, and as she received the word in her Immaculate Heart, and then he took flesh in her womb, so we pray, Jesus, come to me through your mother Mary's intercession. May I have a heart like hers that has no obstacle to the will of the Father, so that I too may give you flesh in the world today, that we may be two as one, one flesh, united for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. So this is a little compendium, a little summary of different Sacred Heart devotions, all of which are designed to set our hearts on fire, deepen our relationship with Him, and to be more aware of his devotion to us. And the next time we will conclude our series by pulling together all the things we've said and by 
reflecting a little more on how we can live this devotion in our daily lives. So until next time, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.